Arlington Catholic, and Arlington's a really, really good friend of, our, of mine. Um, our families have known each other for quite some time. Um, our boys played um, AAU basketball together, and so um, the last time I saw Arlington, he was writing a book about um, should you have your kid play AAU or something along those lines, because it's quite the experience, and if you don't have the dedication and support from family members, it's a very difficult uh, pursuit. But so anyway, so Ar Arlington is a prolific uh, author and writer, and his latest piece is um, called The Man Behind the March. So Arlington, tell us a little bit about, about The Man Behind the March. The Man Behind the March, Doug, is a book about the life and legacy of, of my dad. Okay. Reverend Kelly. Yes. Okay. And uh, tell us a little bit about what, what, what inspired you to write this book. Well, I realized uh, that there was a large uh, piece of history that, that was still missing. Basically, I had heard, seen stories told about my dad being a pioneer of the largest march in the nation. Uh, however, not much was said about his life and uh, other than that. And I wanted to share his history and other things he accomplished, uh, his family uh, life. Uh, be a great, he was a great husband, a great father to us, uh, pastor of not one but two churches, uh, a teacher of almost 40 years, inspired very, very, uh, quite a few young people, as well as people in general. And I just... I, I felt this had to be shared. A lot of people know about the MLK Commission, but prior, uh, that was established by uh, former Mayor Henry Cisneros. Cisneros huh? Yes, yes, and uh, Anna, Anna Araneta Pierce was the uh, uh, inaugural chair person. Uh -huh. chairperson that, that year. But prior to the commission, there was a large piece of history that had not been told. Okay. And I just felt the need, in addition to sharing my dad's legacy, how this all came about, because the march started in 1968 and the commission was established in 1986. So what happened in between then? Okay. And that's what the book talks about. about. Okay. So, so when, when you were um, when you were young, um, how old were you when, when the march started? I was nine. Nine years. Okay. So, so did you did you recognize before then your your dad was a civil rights icon or become a civil rights icon, or did you look at him that way at the house? Because this is about the other side of him. My dad, the great disciplinarian? No, <laughs> I did not look at him as a civil rights icon. <laughs> so, but so you said he was a strict disciplinarian. Now, was he an ex-military person? No, well, yes, because he did serve years, uh, excuse me, he did serve two years in, mm -hmm. in the U.S. Army. And I would not say my dad was strict, strict. Okay. But uh, you definitely had to follow his rules if you lived under his rooftop. My way, my house, right? Or exactly. my house, my way kind of thing? Yes, sir. All right. No, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Well, speaking of that, then, um, you know, do you talk about uh, what, what values that he um, instilled in you that you still carry on today? Quite a few. Um, some of the uh, values that my dad instilled in me, uh, uh, one is courage. Okay. okay. And I say that because it took a lot of courage to do what he did. Oh, absolutely. Back in those days? Back in absolutely, those days, absolutely. It, it took a lot of courage. And one of the things that I admire the most, and I don't think people realize, is that in that first march, in that first march, we were only allowed to march in the right lane of a four-lane street. The street at the time was Nebraska Street. And there weren't that many of us. There was a police officer in the front on a motorcycle, and there was one in the back, and there were about maybe 20 or 25 us. Okay. Think about it. If you wake up in the morning, you're getting ready to go march in just a small group, that's going to draw quite a few stares and curious. And it took a lot of courage to do that. Uh, Especially back in those days, because Nebraska was one of the states on the east side that would still had quite a few uh, Caucasians, uh, white people living on it, correct? Uh, no, it was still quite was, a was few it? blacks. Okay, it, it was okay. still quite a few blacks, but it was one of the streets that my dad had the name changed to MLK, MLK Drive. Right. Wow. So, so all of this was going on, and and you were nine years old. Were you aware of of of, of, of the march? Um, no, it was more an act of obedience okay. and wanting to support my dad uh -huh. uh, because of the love that I had for him. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to be left off. It's, I mean, left out. Where well, Dad went, I wanted you went, to be no, yes, absolutely, absolutely. part of it. I can relate to that. I was that way with my dad as well. So, so all this happened. The march started. In you know, after twenty-five people, was he discouraged the first year that he didn't want to do it the second year, or 
I mean, what, what kept him, what motivated him to continue on until it got the momentum that it has today? His motivation was the love for people. Now, understand the reason why we marched back then. Yes, recognizing Dr. King's legacy, but it was to change primarily the infrastructure on the east side. There were a lot of things that we didn't have. For example, uh, J Street Park. We, there were no parks on the east side, mm -hmm. and so a lot of times the kids would play in the street or wherever they could find an open space. So, uh, Dad, we march uh, uh, for the J Street Park, the MLK Park that's now established. Uh, Dad was also very instrumental in getting jobs for young people. We cleared the MLK Park. A lot of people don't know that. We cleared J Street Park, and what the city did, they created jobs, but Dad oversaw those jobs, and he helped young people get jobs. The city provided the tools we needed, and I'm not speaking about lawnmowers. We went out there with slings, and we just slanging weeds down, slanging weeds down. <laughs> then they gave us gloves, and they gave us axe. There was wow. no power saw. And then we did what the best we could do. Then the city brought in the, 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 the heavy-duty equipment, if okay. I may. But wow. we cleared those parks. Wow. That is, that is, that is right. And you were a part of that, too, is that correct? I was... I wanted, I was a part of it, yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, I would say absolutely, yes. Yeah, absolutely, take credit, take credit for that. Yes, sir. So, so now, so now, this this book, I mean, I mean you're, the blessings are you that there's longer here, and I mean, he'll forever be remembered. Or actually, before I even knew you had written a book, we were talking about, um, a, you know, this whole election thing coming up here with uh, everything. So just about how the legacy of San Antonio, a lot of people don't look at it as a civil rights, you know, haven so so much. You know, a lot, a lot of things happen here. But so... What inspired you to write the book today? Um, again, not to be redundant, but to connect the dots. Okay. Because before the MLK Commission, no one knew. Mm -hmm. For example, the MLK Plaza, mm -hmm. that was Dad's doing. So before there was a statue, there was a plaza. Okay. So we had to fight for the plaza. And right. initially, the city said no. And then we, when they finally agreed to let us have the statue, uh, the MLK Plaza, then we petitioned for or asked for the statue. Well, the city felt it would be a distraction situation where it's currently located because of motorists were having car accidents, but uh, we were able to get that through. Okay. So uh, there's just a lot that, that inspired me uh, to, to uh, write the book. Wow, that is, that is so awesome, awesome, awesome. So now... It's his, you know, his legacy is 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 complete. And but how do you see your legacy? You know, I, I mean, actually, actually, um, so the book is out now. People can buy it today, correct? Yes. Okay. And yes. then how how do how would we do that? Uh, you can just log on to manbehindthemarch.com okay. or www.manbehindthemarch.com, and you can purchase either a paperback, okay, or a hardcover, hardcover. Okay. Excuse okay. me. Is it is it in um, e format? Uh, not yet. Working okay. on it. Okay. Okay. So, so, and so, what do you hope your legacy to be after after writing the book? <laughs> you know, no one's never asked me that question before. <laughs> so, uh, and it was a good. It's a good question. It, my legacy would be similar to my dad's. Now, one of the things I didn't mention was that my dad was the pastor, founder, organizer, builder. Of not one but two churches. And what were the two churches? Uh, the first one was Christian Fellowship Baptist Church, mm -hmm. and then uh, First Gethsemane Baptist Church. Oh wow! I do not know of a pastor who's actually built one church, and both of those structures still stand. I wow! Might add. That is awesome. So when you talk about my legacy, no, I don't see me building two churches. <laughs> <laughs> and unless the Lord says otherwise, I don't see me pastoring a church. But if I can be an example um, to young people, inspire them, be a role model, let them know, hey, it's okay to stumble, fall, but just get back up. Mm -hmm. um, that would be that would be great for me. Um, you know, I taught school for three years at Our Lady of Victory mm -hmm. Middle School, and then I worked over at USAA Insurance Company for three years as a casualty claims adjuster and. There, I'm helping people that were involved in automobile yeah, accidents. Cool. And, and then from there, uh, now I, I own my own uh, real estate brokerage entitled New Home Realty. So we got so, a couple minutes left. Tell us a little bit about New Home Realty. New Home Realty is a company that was established 
back by my wife and I back in 1985, if I'm not mistaken. And okay. now we've been blessed to have 20 agents that do work for our company, and, and we just enjoy helping people uh, find homes and sell homes. Mm -hmm. That's our primary focus. Now, now, do you do you do um, do you do internships with college kids that might be interested in real estate, or is there any kind of connection that can be made with you there? Great question. We don't have a program set up, but it is it is something that we're looking to do in the near future. Okay. Wow. That is something. Now, the last question. What is your favorite part of the book? My favorite part of the book, Doug, I guess it would have to be chapter three when we talk about the village. Okay. Oh, tell me about this. The village is the family piece, our side of dad, when we took trips to Arkansas, and that was our vacation, and we, dad, we spent a lot of time together, and dad taught me how to swim, and a good family time. That That's probably have to be my favorite part of the book, because it, it's, it's brought back great memories. But, uh, uh, yeah. So, you know, that's, uh, speaking of that, you know, it's really something here, you know, we, we obviously, you, you know, what we've been going through with the pandemic, and the weather and all these challenges we've had here in uh, in, in Texas, and um, you know, you talked a lot about about you know the, your dad did a lot of the first a lot of things and he started the march because you know the the east side was 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 almost disenfranchised back then, but you know today here we are you know you know fifty years later, and we still have uh, some of the same problems. Now we do have parks, we do have you know those type things, but it still seems like like there's still people. Who, who have access problems. And, you know, when you see um, the things that happen during the weather with the, the way the pipes happen, the way with the uh, water pipes and the electricity, that's it, they encompass the entire city. But in entire other parts of the city, they have resources. They have plumbers in their neighborhoods. They have um, supply stores in their neighborhoods. They have all of those types of, they have health centers in their neighborhoods, you know, we, which has started this whole conversation. So uh, hopefully, you know, one, and one of the things that happened was that as we have these shutdowns and startups and shutdowns and start now we, we have all these uh, discords. You know, people are having all kinds of problems. They can't stand to be with their husband or can't stand to be with their wife, can't stand to be with their kids. But, be, but you talked about the village. And I think I think that, that that might be one of the most important parts of the book because, you know, that's what's missing today. Out of all those things, you know, problems are going to come. But, you know, if you have family around you, you know, you, you can go a long way. You have that type of support around you. You can make it through just about anything. So I, I appreciate you sharing that with me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, Arlington, what's next? What, it's going to be a part two, the man behind the, the March 2, or what, what's next? Well, what's next, Doug, and I didn't mention earlier, I'm currently working on a gospel CD because I love to sing. Oh. I have been singing for as long as I remember, uh -huh. and uh, I did release my first CD entitled, uh, correction, my uh, first single entitled I Really Love the Lord, which is available on iTunes, and I'm currently working with... Uh, all right, Arista right. Brown, and hopefully get that jazz CD uh, released sometime this summer. All right. So, <laughs> one of the things you don't know about me <laughs> is I've had over two dozen artists come in and do their album releases on my show. And so, so anyway, one of the things anytime when artists comes on the show, you can ask. I can get witnesses. They have to bust the tune for me. You got to do it. All right. Give, let me give me a little bit of "I Love the Lord." <laughs> okay, my musician's not here, but here That's goes. Right. You don't know what he's done for me. Gave me the victory. And I love him. I love him. I really love the Lord. Arlington Callies, the author of The Man Behind the March, and you heard it here, got another CD release. That's like a two dozen and one or something. That would be 25 for y'all. can't count. But anyway, <laughs> I think that was fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. We get that on iTunes. We get the books. Uh, what's the community address again? Uh, that would be manbehindthemarch.com. Manbehindthemarch.com. Thank you so much, Arlington County. Thank you so much. Thank you for your dad. Thank you for sharing with all of us. And, you know, without you writing that book, you know, memories get lost if they're not chronicles. So we appreciate you. You are the man. You are great. 
great job. Thanks, and, uh, Doug. And, and you know what? Uh, when you get that CD ready, yes. come on back. You know, I'll, I'll get I'll get the house band here. I will you, do that. You, Thanks you for that having me. God Absolutely. bless you. God bless you too, Doctor Doug. Here with you, KRB FM, the heart and soul of San Antonio. That we just had here, uh, Arlington Callies. He is the author of a book entitled "The Man Behind the March," a book that chronicles uh, the life and times of. Reverend Kelly, who started the march, and so he's here in our studio live today. Um, him and his beautiful wife is here, uh, Pam, but Pam doesn't want to, but Pam, at least say hello. Hi, how are you doing? <laughs> All right. <laughs> KRB FM, the heart and soul of San Antonio. We'll be right back. Bye, Facebook friends. <laughs> that was outstanding. Thank 